Throughout the 1950s, which is to say my, my uh, teenage years and, and indeed some of my adolescence, the only newspaper I ever read, the only newspaper I ever saw was the Daily Mirror. It came through the letterbox, it was grabbed by my mother, it was grabbed by my father, it was grabbed by, by me, with the whole family read it. But the thing I went for most was the, was the reporting from Hollywood done by Donald Zeck. What I loved about it was it was it took you into this glamorous world of Hollywood. But he was always there. It was not in you always felt what it was like to be there, to be this person being there, so that you could be him. He was a kind of he was your everyman, but with a lot more smartness than every man. You don't have to talk to me, I say to Marlon Brando. But then I don't have to talk to you. Elizabeth Saylor said, in the back seat of, a, of, of the biggest Rolls Royce I've ever been in, in, in Rome as we were going off to have lunch with Valentino, the great fashion designer, in a moment of great intimacy in the back seat of this car, she said to me, you know you're a shit, don't you? We met in London for the first time, before I ever went to Hollywood, and we had lunch. And as happens at a lunch, the Americans, as you know, are wonderfully sociable people. And after this lunch, he was a very important figure in those days. He was almost like a god, uh, certainly in, in American terms. And he said to me casually, when, are you ever going to come to Amer Hollywood? I said, yes, I'm going to come in about six weeks, six months' time. Call me when you arrive. <laughs> So I thought, well, it was one of those invitations, like you say to a relative you never want to meet again. If ever you're in London, <laughs> please call yeah, me. Yeah, call me, yeah. So I uh, said, fine, I'll call you. I arrive at the hotel, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I have to tell you, it was, the temperature outside was 90 degrees, and I'm wearing a, an old 22-ounce crumbie overcoat I think my father gave me, you know. I was totally unprepared. For the mirror hadn't equipped you then for Holland? Well, I, we, I, I learned all these tricks very, very soon. In any event, the phone rings, and uh, the hotel manager, somewhat surprised, he thought he just had an eccentric, eccentric Englishman in the room, but was rather astonished that Humphrey Bogart had actually come to the hotel. And he said, uh, Mr. Zek, Mr. Bogart's in the lobby. I said, well, put him on. And this husky voice said, hey, Limey, I told you to call me when you got to the coast. I said, I've only been here 10 minutes. <laughs> he said, 20 minutes, I just checked. <laughs> then he enters the room and he's got this baseball cap on. He's dressed in denim and it's a Saturday morning and he's, he's all waiting to go down to his beautiful, beautiful yacht that he had in the Los Angeles basin there. And he walks in and he sees all this loop with whiskey from 20th Century Fox with flowers. All from, this had been waiting in your all, room all for All waiting room from Paramount. All signed, uh, welcome to the coast, Mr. Zeke. They all got it wrong. Mr. Zeke, Z Z W E K. Come with, welcome. Have a wonderful time, <laughs> Mr. Leck. You know, <laughs> have a time, Mr. Rick, Mr. Rick. Mr. They got it, everybody got it wrong. But what, the message was, was, was universal. You're here, we'll look after you because in some way we're going to get some return out of it yourself. But when he saw all this, you forgive the uh, vernacular, but he looked around and he said, I see these arseholes have got to you already, he said to me, was the way Bogart referred to all this loot. He said, what are you doing for the weekend? I said, well, I, I, I burbled, you know, but I, I'm up here in, for the very first visit to America. He said, don't answer that question because I know nobody's going to see a friggin' limey, no one understand what you're talking about anyway. He says, so come, you're coming on my boat. Uh, so I, I said, but I, I said, what about all this? He said, let's bring it. <laughs> let's bring it. So we're carrying like a child, like a mother carries a child. We're carrying all this whiskey down into the foyer. And as we're walking past the front desk, if they see Bogart with me trailing behind him, carrying between us about eight gallons of very, very best quality liquor you could possibly imagine. And I remember the hotel manager saying, have a nice weekend, Mr. Bogart. 
And then, of course, I spent this 48 hours with him. And I have to tell you that to be invited on his boat at that time was much more difficult than to get an invitation to, to dinner at the White House. I mean, he only chose very, 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 very few people to, because the boat meant everything to him. That was his escape from Hollywood, with all the, with all the razzmatazz of Hollywood and all the artificiality of it and all the sort of contrivances that create Hollywood. He was in his element, sailing in this beautiful, beautiful schooner. He was in his element on that boat. He would, he would have adoring young actors who would come and scrub the deck just to be close to him. And I was very fortunate he invited me on his, on his boat. And it was wonderful to see him standing there at the tiller and, he, and his, that cigarette drooping from his lips. And he was transported. The hip was ever now. There were no there were no rules. He didn't say to me, "I didn't want. I don't want to talk about show business." Where this is a weekend. You ask me how one gets through to them. The answer is, he didn't want to talk about show business. He didn't want to talk about films. Otherwise, what's the point of having the yacht? Why leave Hollywood? I had the good sense not to even ask him, not even to ask a question because that sounded like an interview. So we sat down and then I asked him how he was getting on with this campaign that he was doing for Adlai Stevenson who was standing for election. And I think he was pleased that I was onto a subject that didn't involve him talking about himself. And then he happened to love chess. I happened to play chess. He said, how do you feel like a game of chess? I said, fine. I was so, I hadn't slept. I was hungover. I was jet lagged. And you were at and sea? I was drunk at beyond belief. And we're sitting on this swaying <laughs> schooner, and I don't know where I am then. Everything's going around in circles, and we play chess. Now it becomes an Anglo British <laughs> contest. <laughs> and Bogart in, he was in his worst needling mood. In other words, the more he liked you, the more he made life miserable for you. I mean, that was the way he was a great needler. He was a great digger into the knife, you know. And so, um, Okay, let's play. So we play. And now I am playing, I was taught very well by my mother-in-law, who at one time played with two of the great Russian chess masters, so I learned a few tricks here. And there. As I'm getting him into a more, more and more difficult position, he doesn't know how to deal with this. So he said to me suddenly, you British, you've got the worst teeth <laughs> out of nowhere. You've got the worst teeth anywhere in the world. I said, check. He's to hell with that. He says, to hell with you. And then he was shoving again. He, he managed to extricate himself from the position. And he said, um, explain to me, how, why the hell does that Duke, Prince, whatever his name is, the, the Queen's uh, husband, why, why the hell does he have to walk three places behind? I mean, it's like, that deference, disgusting deference. And you've got a class written, says, I said, mate. You know. <laughs> he says, to hell with you, you cheated. He said, now let's go back and have a drink. I mean, the man was lovable, lovable. And so we became friends. We became really good friends because I didn't say, what's your last film? What is your next film? Who was your favorite co-star? These are the things which kill an interview. She was in... I mean, first of all, at um, that time, we're talking 1950-60, the most famous woman in the world. But what she was good at was her body. You know, she was fantastic. She knew anatomy better than anybody, in her own anatomy in particular. And her uh, only really big love affair in all these tragic affairs that she had was a love affair with the camera. We travelled once, it always seemed to me things happen to me when I'm on a plane with these people. We were traveling from Los Angeles to Phoenix, Arizona, <coughs> where she was making bus stop on an old Constellation aircraft. That's how far back we're going. Four engine plane and one of them catches fire. <coughs> and there's 10, 10 feet of flame shooting out from one of the engines. I don't know, stewardesses are running backwards and forward. They got Marilyn Monroe on the plane. It would not be a good advert for TWA if the plane would have crashed. 
and he got Marilyn Monroe, the hottest property in, in motion pictures is on the plane. She strapped him beside me and I'm strapped him beside her. And I, it was not a bad place to be if you've got, no, if you've got nothing else to do. And not a bad place to go if you Absolutely. have to go. Absolutely. So we're sitting strapped in and then I, my journalistic brain began to work. I said, you know, I hate to be morbid about this, Marilyn, but you know, if this, God forbid, plane was to crash, you would be on all over page one, page two, page ten, page nine, page twelve, back page, and also in the, on the back page, two lines in italics. They might say that also on the plane was the journalist, my name is him. Then again, the journalistic cunning began to turn over in my mind, and I said, you know, how would you like to be remembered if, God forbid, you know, how would you like to be remembered um, when it's all over, if anything should happen? And then she took it very seriously, as she always did questions like that, took it very, very seriously. Uh, but 500 miles of Arizona desert passed by before she suddenly leaned over to me and she said, here lies Marilyn Monroe, 38, 23, 36. And I have a letter here somewhere from Reader's Digest, which, which used to do the quote of the year, you know, quotable quotes of the year. Can we have permission to use that? And of course that quote went round the world. Yes. So she, and so she said that to you? She said that to me, yeah. It was ticking over in her mind was that. You know, was, uh, it's a, it one's was, brilliant and quite poignant, isn't it? Mm? It's brilliant and poignant all at very the same poignant, time. Very, very poignant. But then when I, people ask me about it, if Arthur Miller, who was a great playwright, eventually found he couldn't cope with it, how could anybody else? I mean, if you read his book, Autobiography of Time Burns, he describes the torment of this, of Marilyn Monroe better than anybody I know. I mean, she was... She was worried about everything. She was worried about her performance. She was worried how she looked. She was worried about how she, what she wore. Before she made a shot a scene, she was worried about would she get the words out and are the words appropriate for Marilyn Monroe? And is the co-star paying her sufficient respect? And is the director understanding what she's doing? So she would ring him constantly during the day, during the evening, during the night. They want me to do this. I don't think I'm ready to do this. These are not things I, how can I say this line? It's a bad line. I don't want to say this line. And anyway, I'm so old and I don't look good. I've got this spot here. I'm very worried. I feel this oh pain. God. I haven't slept for hours. I'm taking pills. I'm taking drugs. I don't know what to do. I've had this call. Somebody wants me to go to, the, to Washington. I don't want to go to, what shall I do? How? I can't begin to describe the agony of, turmoil that was going through the mind of this woman who was never equipped to handle the kind of success that she had. And by equipped, I mean mentally, psychologically equipped to deal with being the most famous woman, because mm. the more famous you are, the greater the expectations of you. And she could never meet the expectations. Nobody could meet the expectations no. required these people. Did she make these kind of demands on you as well? I mean, no, were you no, close enough no, to? No, because I, I, never, I never went into what I would call the red area. Um, What's the red area? The red area, on any dial where it says the red is for danger. That's what I mean. I wouldn't allow the, 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 the needle to flicker over to the dead. By that I would mean anything that would, anything that would encourage her insecurity or might remind her of her insecurity. I was, I was quite happy to look at her, know about her, and understand everything about her without forcing her to articulate about things that would give her agony. But she's ringing you up at four o'clock in the morning London time. To say what? Well, often I would phone and leave a message saying, give me a call, I'd like to talk to you. So she would, she would phone me back. Or she might be saying, I'm coming to, I'm coming to London, I'll be in, in next week or in two weeks' time. I hope we'll get together and so on. Would it be fair to say you were, you, you were friends with each other for a while? Friends? Ish. I, no, we, we were... Yes, we were friends on the level of a movie actress and a, and, and, and a columnist. Um, by that I mean that there are caveats with that kind of rep, rep, relationship. And the caveats, as I've once explained before, 
I must remember that I'm always a, a newspaper man, and she has to remember that she's an actress with a film to sell. So that it's, it's never quite the way I would regard a friendship. Friendship is where there's no strings attached. You can never say that completely about a relationship with an actor or an actress. You have certain obligations on either side. You know. But I remember when they came here, I mean, it was astonishing but her impact on London. And, and Miller were very f funny about that. He said, you know, this entire country could slide into the Indian Ocean. <laughs> no one would even know it because of the impact that Marilyn was having on the people here. I think he, re he viewed this whole thing with, uh, as, as, as he's written about so many times, celebrity as a, a counterfeit kind of business and with a certain degree of, I won't say contempt so much, but a certain, de certain degree of something to be sick, to extricate yourself from. He, he was, he never liked publicity in, in, in all its ramifications. Sad woman. I mean, I had to write her obituary. It was a, a very, very sad moment for me. But she came, she said once, which is, um, I think, rather sad, something like, um, <clears throat> I know I'm difficult. I know I'm neurotic. I know I'm hard to work with. Uh, I know I can be a pain. But if you can't, handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. I must be interested but not overwhelmed, otherwise you're dead. I've well, that's all very well to since say. Then I, since then I've interviewed American presidents, I've interviewed at least four prime ministers. Yeah, OK, but that, by that time you've acquired the skill. Here yeah. you are, a new man, in, if not a new man to the job, a new man in Hollywood. You, you land in America, uh, you, you land running, so to speak. Um, but then I, had, I, I, I knew that the approach to all of them was knowledge. I need to know all about them before I even spoke to them. Otherwise, I knew I was dead, on, dead in the water. It's very hard to say because it sounds like self-aggrandizement, but... The important thing with all these celebrities was they were always as insecure as I was. <laughs> they were always afraid of their image. They were always scared that, you know, I was a stranger. What am I going to do to them? They talked to a guy who's got, whose paper re is read by millions. Uh, will I get it right? So they need to be reassured in the first 10 seconds that you're worthwhile talking to, that maybe you're worthwhile trusting. How, do you re how did you reassure, how did you do that in the first 10 seconds? It's some kind of journalistic alchemy. I, I really don't know the answer, but it's because basically I admired them and I respected them without necessarily adoring them. That's the, that, that was the difference. And the moment I learned later on in life when you cease to adore, the moment you cease to adore certain people, then you get telegrams, as it happened with Frank Sinatra. When I, for one moment, my moment of adoration slipped, and I got a telegram saying, "Dear Donald, I thought you were my friend, but as of this morning, you blew it." You know, <laughs> were you frightened? <laughs> I, as the years passed, I sort of got time off for good behaviour after a while. But these people have ways of making you change your mind, don't they? You didn't feel you didn't feel anything was going to happen to you when you I don't, when you I, crossed I, Frank Sinatra. Well, quite apart from that, I thought the more um, I got letters of complaint, they take the sum total of what you've written about them, and they take the view well, one bad column doesn't alter the fact that the day before or the week before or the month before I'd said how brilliant they were and how wonderful they were. Did you know this out of your own just innate yeah. intelligence or was it, was it were journalists trained differently then? No, it's really it's my knowledge of human beings the extent to which there's a time and a place for everything that they will, they will respond and they will do what they will answer you when they're, when they're good and ready, when, when, when the atmospherics are right. So that I would have interviews with Monroe, for example, with Marilyn Monroe, 
in which nothing is said, in which simply nothing is said, but everything is observed. I don't want to lose you no, no, in this. No, no, no. I mean, well, how do you, you turn up, as you say, and you meet all those, not just all this liquor, yeah. but there are all these dames, and there are all these famous names. How do you, how do you keep your feet on the ground? How did you keep your feet on the ground? Did you keep your feet on the ground? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. She wouldn't have talked had I not shown some respect for the situation she was in, rather than salivating over the fact that she was involved in a scandal. But I was very sad for Chaplin then, because great as he was, he had learned the art of calling it a day when the day needed to be called. In, the, in that particular period, the 1950s, you have to see it in the context of Hollywood at that time. Um, not so long after the Second World War, the prime entertainment for almost everybody on the globe was motion pictures. And Hollywood was at its height. I mean, they were turning out masterpieces after masterpieces by their, on their terms. They never had it so good. And all the great stars of that period were like America's equivalent of royalty. I mean, they were, the names that I would mention now may mean nothing to anybody today, but when I, in my first week, when I arrived off the old Queen Mary, which is now some exhibit now in Long Beach, when I arrived off the old Queen Mary, and checked into the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, with this, all this exotic sort of suite occupied by Howard Hughes and visiting shakes and all the great people, you know, with... Uh, the whole suite was stacked with liquor and whiskey and bourbon and chocolates and flowers and from all the great studios who were fascinated by the idea that an Englishman working for the largest daily paper in the world, as the Mirror was at that time, five and a quarter million circular day, circulation a day, which is unheard of in newspapers. So I was something of a, something, as Lou Grade used to say, not for my pretty face, but the circulation meant a great deal. The Americans loved figures, loved numbers, and I represented an important kind of import into the country. So, when so I they, was, Hollywood wanted you as much as the as much as the Mirror wanted Hollywood. Well, there were at that time everything that Hollywood made in the web overseas profits. The vast majority came from Great Britain. At that really? time, we had four thousand five hundred first-class cinemas in the country. Twenty-two million people went to the cinema every week. It was unheard. I mean, it was the audience was tremendous. So. If you assume that the Daily Mirror had two and a half readers per copy of the paper, so that 40 million people read the paper every day, which meant a lot, of, a lot to Hollywood. So that I was lucky in the sense that here was Hollywood with an enormous number of products to sell, some very, very great people to project and promote, suddenly being presented with a well-known columnist in London who presumably would carry on the process of promotion. So when I went there, in the first week, I met John Wayne, Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn, Henry Fonda, Cary Grant, Marilyn Monroe, Marlon Brando, I mean, all these famous people, Mario Lanza and so on, on a level which was unheard of today. I mean, they treated me slightly differently. And you asked me how I managed to do it. And I think the important thing was to recognize how important they were, not to treat them the way you, they do now, celebrities, with a certain degree of disgust, a certain degree of disdain, and a certain degree of suspicion, and above all, in total ignorance of what, they, what these people really were. If you look at all the great people, and they were almost legends there, but they're certainly legends today. They all had different additional dimensions to them. Did you ever feel you, you got it wrong and you blew an opportunity that you regret now? I think there must have been okay. Yes, I'm sure I must have. But there's nothing you're losing sleep over at the moment. Um, or have been losing sleep over. 
I sometimes think I've, I haven't done the... Uh, there, there are many occasions when I think I really have got... I really didn't do well at something. Sometimes when I've been... Spent weekends, uh, 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 some time with, with a man of the stature of Orson Welles, the great auteur, the great writer, the great actor, and the great film director who made Citizen Kane. And of course he was a, a legend in Hollywood. Sometimes I feel I didn't really get the value out of him, and I realized this is my fault, not his, um, that I didn't realize at the time that I actually was in the presence of a genius. And sometimes I regret, why didn't I ask them that? Or why didn't I think of doing that? The same with Charlie Chaplin, who means nothing today, but in the 1950s, he was the, the man everybody spoke spoke of in hushed voices and I met him in Veve when he was already had been barred from returning to America and he was then a, uh, a sad old man and um, I suppose perhaps I did but I could have made more of that situation of being alone with him. He was, his daughter had got married and I was invited to the wedding and it was Literally everybody in the world of any of any note was there. I remember Noel Cow sitting in a chair, surrounded by all his adoring fans, and he was rippling off all these wonderful Noel Cow anecdotes one after the other. And and Charlie Chaplin just signaled me to come over and took me up to his office. And we sat down, and he'd made a film with Marilyn Brando and Sophie Loren which had bombed, called The Countess from Hong Kong. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it was a poor film. And Chaplin, who was synonymous with motion pictures, created Hollywood, along with Mary Pickford and others, was unhappy that they should treat him and his, and his work with such derision, you know. Uh, and he said, why, why are they treating me like this, you know? And it was in a dark room, it was very dark, no bigger than this room. And I felt such pity for him, this man totally out of sync with his times. He wasn't content to rest on, I mean, there were a few talking films that he made, like The Great Dictator, maybe, and the Monsieur Verdoux, which were good films, but nothing compared with the films he made of the tramps that were legendary to me. But I was very sad for Chaplin then, because great as he was, he had learned the art of calling it a day when the day needed to be called. Uh, he thought he'd go on forever. Well, he'd go on living forever, but you can't go on being a genius forever.